Once again, good morning. Once again, good morning to. Yeah. <laughs> once again, good morning to one and all who are with us here and also uh, joining our service online. Uh, this morning, we come to the concluding portion of First Timothy. Allow me to read to us uh, the text on the screen. No. Okay, if not, then I will ask, request us to pull out our Bibles, uh, or our phones, right, these days. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 to 21. I will go slightly slower, perhaps, so it's easier for us to follow. Give another five seconds in case we are trying to click our phones. 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 21. Allow me to read. 1 Timothy 6, 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives to all things, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who is the testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwell in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. Verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provide us everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposits entrusted to you. Avoid the irrelevant babbles and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Well, this conclusion of Timothy is replete with words of warning and exhortation if we follow the reading earlier on. Now, this feature led me to come up with my own homespun summary and uh, reflection statement. Something like this. Attractions, power drives. Focus, lead to life. Now, what is Paul warning against? We see it's replete with warning and exhortation. Paul warned against two things in this concluding portion of his letter. He warned against the love of money and also false teachings. These two things that Paul warned against, I call them attractions. Now, in church, we are used to call the love of money and false teaching distractions. We term it in such a way because in church, the supposed subject is God, right? And also our life of faith. So, whatever that might dis distract us, rob our concentration from worship and spiritual growth, we will label them as distraction. Yet, I want to say that money and false teaching are really attractions and not just distractions. Attractions, by attraction, I say that I, I, I'm referring to them being objects that will captivate people's attention. Attractions, power drives in people to get them. Attractions can even make Christians deprioritize our life of faith and go high gear to obtain whatever that attracts them, especially money. Now, I 
also think that Paul meant to shout these warnings out loud to the readers. Why? We read of this warning at a part of the letter where Paul would typically pen words of greetings and instruction on things to be done. If we check against the other two pastoral epistles, the instruction in those two, 2 Timothy and Titus, was to ask Timothy and Titus uh, respectively to go to where Paul is. But here, in 1 Timothy, we see him foregoing the greetings and instead he rehashes subjects already discussed. Now, Paul's re-emphasis suggests to me that this love of money and false teaching are something that is attractive, something dangerous, something that to Paul we should avoid as much as possible. That's why having said it, he said it again and perhaps again. Now the question is this. This morning when we sit here, the question to ask is, are these warnings applicable to us? If not, what for? Right? My answer would be a yes and a no. Uh, let me first talk about false teaching. Now in Jubilee, uh, I, I think, okay, you can correct me if I'm wrong. In Jubilee, I think false teaching is not an issue. But, still there's a but. But I think ours is a world where all sorts of teaching on faith get passed around easily through internet, word of mouth, and Christian music as well. All sorts of teaching get passed around. Now, some of this teaching, I, in my view, are a very good mix of sound and not so sound teaching. If we are not careful, we will want to listen when we uh, encounter such teaching. Because, why? Because they are sound. Sound yet interesting. Or I will say sound slash false. And as we listen on, let's say, in time to come, I think we might begin to buy in to this new mix and mixes. And these new mixes tend to encourage us to love God more, yet at the same time, demand of Him more. Right? This is one way these mixes can go. To love God more, yet at the same time, to demand and control Him more. Uh, and I think a common example will be the name it and claim it prayer. I, I, I have indeed read of somewhere where a father taught a son to pray for a bicycle, must be purple in colour, and you get what I'm saying, right? You get what I mean. Now, all these kind of mixes can come in such a form where it, it asks us to love God more, yet at the same time, it is more man-centred instead of God-centred. So, I want to say that whether the warning on false teaching is applicable to us right now, today or not, in our world, which is an unchecked melting pot of ideas, I think Paul's warning is something that we should keep in mind at least. Then, how about the warning on money? Well, money, first of all, is uh, the all-time favourite Right? Am, I right? Am I right to say this? Love of money is an all-time favourite. We hear it all the time. Still, is it applicable to us? Now, I would say for my nine years in Jubilee, uh, I have seen many brothers and sisters who are... Wait, why am I here? Back. Back. <laughs> uh, back. If back, is it the first one already? No, back, please. Back, back, back. Uh, okay, the next one then. Okay, all right. You stop there, I, I'll try. Yes, here, all right. Now, I, I want to say that for my own nine, um, for my nine years in Jubilee, I have indeed found uh, quite many of our brothers and sisters, uh, people who are really doing good, who are rich in good work, who are generous and ready to share. And I'm blessed to be in such a community. And some of us are even people who will walk the extra mile doing it every so often, do it pretty much like a regular activity. So in this case, uh, do we still need to spend another minute to go through what Paul is talking, a warning about this love of money? 
Uh, still, I would say, perhaps yes. And why? The love of money, as we say, remains an all-time favourite. And there's good reason for that. As Christians, we are not for the love of money. Correct? Those who agree with me, raise your hand. If you don't, you all love money. Huh? Right? As Christians, we are not for the love of money. Yet, yet we are people for fulfilling responsibility. That, that, that will often need money. Huh? Responsibility in Singapore. Many things, almost everything in Singapore is tied to money. We are for fulfilling responsibility, responsibilities and, and, and that, and that need cost of money. We are also for better and more comfortable lifestyles. We are for future planning as responsible people. And in all these areas, I would say it's possible that we are pressed unknowingly and unwittingly to focus more on money than we initially hoped to be. So perhaps we can say this then, in this case, that Paul's warning on the love of money, at the very least, would caution us to be a little wary of the preferences of the populace. That means, whatever people like, yes, they are nice, but just, just think a bit more before we jump on the bandwagon. And it also, on the flip side, nudges us to channel our focus on things that has true value. Now, talking about focus, uh, this leads me to the second half of my own homespun summary statement. That is to focus, that, which is focus leads to life. Now, Paul states twice in his, in his concluding verses what he believes should be yours and my focus. He used slightly different terminologies each time and he states it, but it actually means quite the same. Right? That is to take hold of eternal life or to take hold of that which is truly life. A bit of a mouthful, the second one, but I think it's a meaningful uh, thing that he's saying here. Now, the first thing I want us to take note would be this. The first thing would be the attitude that Paul is pushing for when he say what he says here. We see the word, the term, take hold, appears twice. And to, take hold actually translates a Greek verb that is associated with this group of words. Right? Take hold generates this picture of being proactive, aggressive, fighting, seizing, tenacious. Now, have we had... What are this? I'm trying to... Let me try something to see if you can make us feel a bit better what this take hold and all this adjective uh, are trying to describe. Have we ever had meals uh, with people or have snacks with people who don't usually quite eat the things that's put on the table? Have we had people like that? Just want to talk only. Uh, don't quite eat. But, but, but when it comes to, at those times when what's on the table is what they really like. Or it could be some preserved fruits, it could be durian, it could be some savoury dish. Then, on, in those times, you are still going at your own pace, you know, you are still slowly eating, fellowshipping. Then, all of a sudden, you find that everything on that plate is gone already. Have you amused with people like that? No, no one ever had that. I have that quite often times. Okay. And then if you ever meet a person like that, then you will, you will find that, wow, that person in front of you just... Just, just chomps down everything before you could even have a second serving for your own self, you know. There's really no courtesy, no mercy, no spirit of sharing. Everything sips, just sap up within lightning speed. You know, this, this chong all the way, this going all the way, this doing it violently, I think is what Paul is trying to suggest when he used the word take hold. I think that's the kind of picture that he's saying. Just grab, just seize it. To do it even violently. Now, when I use the word violently, does it make things sound bad? I want to ask. We might not like the idea, right? Spirituality links with violence. Now, remember the Bible story where Jacob wrestled with God? He fought really hard through the whole night, violently. 
seizing God. And what happened in the, in the end when the sun rises? God bless him. Right? God bless him. Abraham? Remember Abraham sacrificing Isaac? Old uncle? Walked for three days? Carry whatever he could? Just, there's just no sacrificial lamb? Isaac walked with him all the way. Tenaciously he went. And he went all the way until he lifted his knife and sweat it out. What happened? God provided a sacrifice. So, uh, so what I want to say is this proactiveness, this aggressiveness, this tenaciousness, and even doing, this, doing it violently, uh, it's altogether biblical. Then you will ask, hey, you know, day-to-day -day terms, what do you mean? Go out and practice violence, huh? In day-to-day -day terms, I think to take hold of that which is truly life really means what I've shown us just now. That is to be proactive. That is to be tenacious. To continue to do what we have been doing. To do good and to show generosity. That's what Paul means. But not just to do when you have time. To do it in a proactive, aggressive, tenacious manner. And to do so would mean that whether what we face with is progress or regress, whether we feel appreciated or disappointed, we just press on. That's what Paul wanted to say. But then the next question would be this. Why is there a need to stress tenaciousness? I mean, we do, we have already been doing it. Why Paul need to stress tenaciousness? Is it because the people back in the church in Ephesus weren't doing, weren't doing it? I think that might be a more fundamental reason. And the reason is this. It's a must. It's a must. Now, remember that Jesus said about, do, uh, about doing good work and showing generosity in these places, we, saw, we, we read them mentioned. In Matthew 7, verses 24 and 25, and in Luke 12, we read of Jesus encouraging the doing of good works and showing generosity. And then to do such things will be like to build a house on a firm foundation, a solid foundation that's able to withstand destructive forces or to lay up treasures in heaven. Yet, look with me to the last verse right down there and also the captions on top. The same chapter, chapter 7, where we read warning, or where we read encouragement, we also find warning on people who refuse or fail to do God's good will. Now, when when the Lord uses this dual approach of encouragement and warning to push the message across, the hard and soft approach thrown in at the same time, I think it's meant to stress that good work and generosity is indeed something that must be there in the life of his followers. Here and there, when we try to encourage friends, we use hard and soft approach. and I mean, that's because we think that that thing should happen. Are we right or wrong? That's a separate matter. But here, Jesus is doing it because he thinks this should be there. Hard and soft approach both thrown in. That's because the good work and generosity are the evidence of one's salvation. And so that's why it must be there. Now, in saying this, I must say, uh, I must also give a quick, make a quick clarification. And even if you have heard about this, heard of such clarification for a thousand times, uh, I still have to make this clarification. That is, Jesus is not saying that we will be saved or we will be favoured because of our good works. No. What he's saying is that good works and generosity must be evident in the life of those who are saved because they are the necessary expressions of new life energized by grace. If there's grace in your life, then it's a natural, necessary expression. 
Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm really stressing quite hard this morning on this point. And I believe we get the message. And we are reminded to take hold of that which is truly life, that is to keep doing good and to show generosity. And that this thing is a must. But, but honestly, I think to do this is not something that uh, may be as natural for some of us, me included. And if that's the case, that allowed me to share three thoughts that I have. And I hope that these three thoughts can help us uh, to, be, to go more natural in this take hold of that which is truly life. Now, the most striking thing when we read this conclusion of 1 Timothy is that in the middle of Paul advising Timothy uh, on topics like riches and false teaching, in the midst of urging him to, pers to pursue virtues and keep the commandment, all of a sudden, he bursts into doxology before he write on and finish what he wanted to say initially. So, friends, picture with me just for a moment. Okay, let's picture Paul. Paul, see Paul, in your eyes, see Paul, think of Paul. Paul, sitting there at his desk, lift a pen in his hand, prayerfully thinking, praying, slowly writing, what to write to Timothy on the issue of riches. The next, what about false teaching. He was still thinking and writing and then all of a sudden you see him just went, burst out into the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. Don't you find it a bit strange? Have you ever had friends that write that way? Right? Halfway down? Come back. It's a bit random, right? Not xiao, but random, right? Now, the question is, what if this breaking out or this lapsing into worship is, is not something at all random for Paul? Is it possible? Is it possible for Paul to just suddenly went off track from his writing and then... It's not at all something that's random. Now, if that's the case, then it would mean this. It would mean that life for Paul is lived by honouring the presence of God at all times with the help of the Holy Spirit. God says that he is with us at all times and Paul just took it literally, took it seriously. Hence, that vision of the immortal and invisible God was never, never, ever far from his mind. And I think this has to be the reason why while thinking of how to help Timothy, suddenly he would just lapse into doxology and then just went on praising God, Amen, before he continued to write again. Now, if this assumption is correct, then I think Paul's life is instructive for us. Now, we say that Paul lived his life before one audience. He always honoured what God said. God said, I'm there. He said, yes, God, you are there. He always lived his life before one audience through the help of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, all the advice that he has ever given was framed within this abiding presence of God. Question, how might you and I be different? Now, could it be for us as Singaporeans, uh, our life goes something like this. Sunday morning, we are here. So, you know, we are in church, and so therefore our audience or our audiences will include God, right? We sing to God just now. Okay, our audiences will include God, our church friends and our fellow church members. Sunday afternoon, off-site church ready. Uh, our primary audience, our, our primary audience might be our family members and friends that we are going to catch up over the weekend. Mondays to Fridays, uh, depending on who we meet in, uh, or need to face in schools and at workplace. You now we live life facing people and issues that, that we need to deal with. Uh, could God be there? Uh, I think sometimes yes, sometimes no. In the evenings, tired, right? We need to chew. And then when we chew and wind down, uh, there might, there usually will be another switch again. You, you don't want to think about work, you think about something else, you switch, right? Um, that's one 
audience that I often face when I myself wind down. Uh, anyone want to guess? Uh, this, this whatever has a name. Anyone want to guess who's the audience that I face? Huh? Ah, not bad. Any more? My daughter. Any more? But she, she sleep early. La. I sleep better than her. Any more? Correct. <laughs> Netflix. See, we always live our life to, 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 to different, different audiences and objects and subjects. Uh, Paul, very different, right? Paul, we know that he, he say what he say, not because he's a teacher, you know. He say what, oops, he say what he says because he's, he is being a life example uh, to Timothy. And therefore, when we read Paul's letter, we can see that he, he kept taking hold of that which is truly life because he always lived life to one audience, no matter who else might be around at the same time. And he acts and responds according to what that one audience might be prompting him. Now, so may we learn to be like Paul somewhat. When God say, he says that he's around, how we take it seriously? We take it literally. We also learn to live our life to this one audience and strive to remain in his presence. And perhaps when we do that, this so-called taking hold of that which is life, which again uh, refers to doing good and showing generosity, can be something that even more natural, that, that, that flows once even more naturally. Because that one audience prompts, that one audience care, we just follow and participate and flow along with him. So this is my first suggestion. Second, second, um, we say early on that taking hold of that which is truly life is a must. Uh, and I believe we do want to do it, right? and we have been trying. But, but uh, we may not always have the opportunity to do them. Now, our church at this point of time is gearing up in terms of evangelism, and uh, we have been encouraging our members uh, to pray pray for people whom we can reach out to, uh, pray for the team that is working on um, the new friends. Uh, I'd like to suggest that we add one more thing to the list. Uh, sorry, it should be plural, not singular for the word opportunity. Um, to pray for opportunities. And also, that, uh, and also the willingness to step forwards when those opportunities really just come to us when the opportunities arrive. And who knows that as we go about doing good and showing generosity, the door will be open for the gospel. Uh, before I joined the theological college to study full-time, I was full-time in a mission agency uh, that does uh, work in southwestern part of China. Uh, the agency that I was with um, does things above board, uh, meaning uh, we don't do cold turkey, we don't do any of those. We actually liaise with the government, we liaise with the uh, hospitals, you know, all the, all the official bodies. Uh, and then through that, we do different, different things. And one thing that I saw a couple of times is that uh, here and there, people will ask, ask one question. After a while, they were asked, why you guys keep coming back? They know that we are from Singapore, a more comfortable place. They asked, no. We went there back then because that place, the per annum capita, was only 70 US dollars. That's why we went there constantly. And people started to ask, you guys, why you keep coming back? They didn't ask why you come, why you guys keep coming back? And slowly, when we tell share with them, we are here to share God's love and goodness. And the door slowly opened up. Who knows when we try? And we, and we want to try, we need opportunities. Put that in our prayer list. That's my second suggestion. Lastly, friends, do we know that God is pro-enjoyment? Here the verse says that, uh, in verse 17, that God richly provides us with something Sorry, with everything <laughs> to enjoy. God is pro-enjoyment. Only 
only that God's definition of enjoyment is one that is against hoarding, against selfishness. Instead, sharing uh, is to God part and parcel of enjoyment. Now, don't get uh, the Bible wrong. Uh, God is not against accumulation. And we are not told to sell everything and give away everything. We are only told here to be ready to share. That's all that is said here. But even to do so, it might pose some challenge for some of us. Why? Uh, just this week, one night, I turn on the news and it tells me that uh, water bills is going up. The second night, I go the same time, same channel, news again, it tells me electricity bill will also be going up. To share can pose a challenge and also the tempo and intensity uh, in which we live life in our city means that time and energy are precious, limited commodities. To do good, to share is a must, but not always easy, not always easy for everybody. Then what can we say? I think it has to go down to faith. And the one who advised us to do good and to share tells us that we do have help. Uh, who, who among here is super familiar with uh, Paul's letter? I don't want the arrow Pastor Wilson, uh, but I think I saw Eden making uh, uh, a move there. Huh? Okay, now, every single of Paul's letter will always end with a prayer for grace, without fail. Now, what is grace? Grace, in other words, is, enable, is enablement by God, God enabling us to do something. Now, for grace to be a standard sign of, of every apostle's letter goes to say one thing, that grace is something absolutely essential. Okay, grace is an absolute essential. And so as Christians, we store up good deeds. And it is a must. But it is possible only by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, by grace. Now what it means is this, uh, that we are called to step forward and be ready to share. But it is after all God who gives the provisions and God who does the work. And, it's, and exactly because of this, the Bible also tells us as Christians there's nothing for us to be prideful about and nothing to boast about apart from the gospel and the gospel alone. So my three suggestions for us this morning. Honour what God says. He said that He's there. Honour it and live in His presence. Pray for opportunity because it's a must. And when it's a must, yes, stress. Don't get too stressed. Depend on God's grace. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we want to give you thanks that as you call us, you also energize and, 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 and enable us. And this morning, we are called to be attentive to your constant presence, to walk in your presence, to interact with others in your presence to use kind words which will be a form of doing good, to give of our time and resources as a way to show generosity and the way that you will lead us in particular in those different situations. And we know, Lord, as we are called, we also can we can not because of us, but because of our God who will go before us. We give you thanks.